Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you to Emily Malik and uh, the Utah Re Recycling Alliance for being our co-sponsors of this event. Uh, this is really special. I had the opportunity to take place in this, take part in this last year, and it's a really important event. In the spirit of recycling, uh, you may certainly use that uh, introduction again for somebody else, but I'm not sure it'll make much sense when you do. So, um, you know, sometimes when I take a moment to look around campus. I am struck by the sheer beauty that surrounds us. Just take a look out some of these windows. Um, frankly, I am in awe of it. We live in a truly special place on a truly special planet. A planet that, as beautiful as it may be, is more than just eye candy. It's a planet that nurtures us, provides for us, inspires us, and challenges us. It's truly a Mother Earth. We humans sometimes ignore an important vital lesson. We are the ones who reap the most important benefits of a cleaner, healthier planet. Our planet is tough. It's been around for about four and a half billion years. It'll be around for much longer, if nothing else than a spinning rock around the sun. We people, however, are pretty fragile creatures, and we can only remain as long as we take care of our planet and its ability to sustain us, because in that way we take care of ourselves. That's why maintaining a beautiful and sustainable campus is one of my top priorities as president. At WSU, it's our institution's obligation to educate, but that stretches more beyond that, more than just imparting job skills. We must also impart the wisdom of being good stewards, not just the for the benefit of our planet, but in our own self-interest. And sometimes the best way to teach is to lead by example. I'm pleased to say that WSU is setting a fine example. We're constructing energy efficient buildings and saving lots of energy and lots of money by making simple changes to the way that we run our campus. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had the Ogden City Council and Ogden's mayor in addition to transit authorities on our campus to discuss mass transit options to w to, for students and faculty and staff to get to WSU. I understand that Secretary of the Interior Sally Jewell will share more news of WSU's sustainability efforts during her keynote talk later this morning. Of course, there's much more work to be done when it comes to sustainability, and Weber State looks forward to more ways to contribute or maybe not to contribute if we're talking about pollution. Our first speaker for this sustainability summit studies a form of pollution that we all recognize, particulate air pollution. Every winter, a gray yellow haze descends upon us for days and sometimes weeks at a time. And we Northern Utahs are, to Utahns are told to stay indoors and avoid the outdoors. Dr. C. Arden Pope III knows the negative effects of that gray-yellow muck all too well. His cross-disciplinary research concerning air pollution, epidemiology, and environmental economics resulted in seminal studies on the adverse health effects of air pollution. Currently, he serves as the Mary Lou Fulton Professor of Economics at Brigham Young University. Dr. Pope has conducted research on various natural resource and environmental issues He's collaborated on important studies that examine the effects of short-term and long-term air pollution and, and what they have, uh, the effects on our health. And he plays a vital role in reviewing and interpreting the literature on that subject. Dr. Pope is a former fellow at the Harvard School, School of Public Health. He received his PhD in economics and statistics from Iowa State University, where he received his master's degree and he earned his bachelor's degree from BYU. Although, I'm pretty sure that he could have gotten a stellar education at Weber State instead. <laughs> his honors include the Utah Governor's Medal for Science and Technology and the Thomas T. Mercer Joint Prize from the American Association for Aerosol Research and the International Study for Aerosols in Medicine. The American College of Chest Physicians also recognized him as an honorary fellow. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. C. Arden Pope III.
Well, good morning. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, <laughs> you know, I haven't had a lot of chances to be at Weber State, but every time I've been here, I've loved it. It's a wonderful university, wonderful place to come. And I appreciate being able to speak at the Intermountain Sustainability Summit this year. So I'm going to give a, an overview of the effects of particulate air pollution on human health, focused on the science, the controversies, and public policy. Now, the scientific literature has now grown so large, and the public policy efforts are so substantial that this overview will necessarily be selective and brief. Now, the relevant, the relevant scientific literature probably starts with the observational studies of severe air pollution episodes in the early to mid-1900s in Meuse Valley, Belgium, in Donora, Pennsylvania, in London, England. And these episodes demonstrated that extreme levels of air pollution, even for just a few days, can contribute substantially to cardiovascular and respiratory disease. It also contributes to death. Thousands of people died as a result of the air pollution episode in London. And these extreme episodes were often referred to as killer smog episodes. Now, the dramatic effects of severe air pollution episodes motivated public policy efforts to control air pollution. In the United States, legislative efforts included the Clean Air Act, and its, and its various amendments, and they helped reduce air pollution and eliminate these killer smog episodes. By the 1980s, many thought that, air pollution, that the air pollution problem in the U.S. was largely solved. However, by the late 1980s and early 1990s, the results of several loosely related studies suggested that moderate levels of air pollution Levels common to modern U.S. cities also have significant health effects. And this was the time that I was involved. Some of these studies were my own. For example, in the 1980s, I moved to the Provo Orem area of Utah. This metro area, as most of you know, is situated in a mountain valley, similar to the valley here. Temperature inversions often trap air pollution near the valley floor, which serves as a natural test chamber for pollution exposure. Furthermore, in the 1980s, the largest, uh, the largest local source of air pollution, the Geneva Steel Mill, shut down for 13 months and then reopened, providing this amazing natural experiment. So as you know, on days without inversions, our valleys are beautiful. They're very clean. However, as illustrated in, in, in the photo to the right, now this is actually a photo taken back when Geneva was operating, and we had a, one, one bad, well, we had a lot of bad inversions like this at the time. And it can get very, very bad. You can't even really see the valley floor. Still wasn't as bad as these killer fog episodes that I mentioned. So the intermittent operation of the steel mill produced a natural experiment where the primary source of pollution in our natural exposure chamber was shut off for 13 months and then turned back on. Now we use this opportunity to study pollution effects on children's respiratory hospitalizations. The operation of the mill clearly contributed to elevated levels of air pollution Pediatric hospital admissions for bronchitis, asthma, and total respiratory conditions were also approximately doubled. Now this plot illustrates the concentrations of fine particulate pollution in Utah Valley over 12 years. There's clearly a lot of exposure variability, largely the result of a different sort of natural experiment. We're putting a lid on the valley and taking it off, and putting a lid on the valley and taking it off, resulting in this, this dramatic um, variability in fine particulate air pollution. Now, we've taken advantage of this exposure variability in a number of studies. So, for example, Illustrated here are daily death counts plotted over a five-year period in Utah Valley. In the blue plot on the right, these counts are sorted, 
and mean death counts are plotted over quartiles of air pollution. Now we can easily observe that increased air pollution is associated with increased daily death counts. Now more, more sophisticated statistical analyses controlling for time trends, seasonality, temperature, etc., all demonstrate similar associations. Now remarkably, the air pollution related excess deaths were largely due to cardiovascular disease. Further evidence that air pollution affects cardiovascular disease comes from studies that focus on specific, well-defined, serious cardiovascular disease events. For example, a study of nearly 13,000 well-defined and followed up cardiac patients who lived on Utah's Wasatch Front and who had coronary angiography were studied. Just a few days of exposure to fine particulate air pollution significantly increased the risk of heart attacks and related ischemic heart disease events in adults, especially in patients with underlying coronary artery disease. Now, the few selected studies that I have just shown are just illustrative of a large and growing body of literature that has explored the effects of short-term air pollution exposure on cardiopulmonary health. Small but remarkably consistent associations between air pollution and cardiopulmonary deaths, hospitalizations, ischemic heart disease events, and related health outcomes have been, have been observed using data from over 100 cities throughout the U.S. and in other parts of the world. So, we now know that day-to-day -day changes in exposure are associated with daily death counts, hospitalizations, lung function symptoms, respiratory illness, ischemic heart disease, and various other health endpoints. The question is, what about long-term, long-term exposure to air pollution? Well, there's been this parallel research that has also indicated that substantially larger health effects occur with longer air pollution exposure. In 1993, we published a well-designed prospective cohort study of air pollution and risk of death. This study, commonly referred to as the Harvard Six Cities Study, was a 14 to 16 year prospective follow-up of over 8,000 adults living in six U.S. cities with different levels of air pollution. Now this figure presents unadjusted survival curves for the Harvard Six Cities cohort. Participants were enrolled from two clean, two highly polluted, and two average polluted cities. On the horizontal axes of this graph are follow-up years, with time zero indicating the time of enrollment and subsequent numbers indicating years of follow-up. Now on the vertical axes is the proportion of the cohort that was alive. At time zero or at time of enrollment, you can see all of the cohort was alive. In fact, that was a condition of enrollment. <laughs> Over time, and as participants died, the proportion of the survivors goes down. Remarkably, the curves splay out in such a way as to indicate that survival is lower in the more polluted cities versus the cleaner cities. Now, after using various statistical techniques to control for age, sex, smoking habits, and other risk factors, the adjusted risks of dying were nearly linear, uh, were nearly linearly associated with the levels of air pollution. Now motivated by the early Harvard Six Cities uh, results, we wanted to see if similar associations between air pollution and risk of death could be observed in another much larger and independently collected cohort. We collaborated with researchers from the American Cancer Society and used data from the ACS CPS2 cohort of over a million people. This research was initially published in 1995 and extended analyses have been published including this paper in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2002. Now the basic findings from the various ACS studies are similar to those observed from the Harvard Six Cities study. Increased levels of fine particulate matter and related air pollution 
were associated with increased risk of death, especially cardiopulmonary disease death or, or heart and lung disease related deaths. In fact, further analyses of the Harvard Six Cities, I'm sorry, of the American Cancer Society study have indicated that air pollution is most strongly associated with deaths from ischemic heart disease, dysrhythmias, heart failure, cardiac arrest, and related heart disease. Now, even back then, the reported results of the Harvard Six Cities and ACS studies that indicated health effects of air pollution were much larger than the studies of short-term exposure and, and, and they suggested substantial public health impacts. As such, these studies have undergone substantial scrutiny. The Health Effects Institute oversaw large reanalyses of both studies and conducted additional extended analyses. The results were clearly demonstrated to be reproducible and remarkably robust. The results of these studies were also questioned in regards to the revised national ambient air quality standards for particulate matter and were challenged legally. This legal uncertainty was largely resolved with a unanimous ruling, which basically supported the science and the air quality standards by the Supreme Court in 2001. In addition to the Harvard Six Cities and ACS studies, shown in the maroon and, and blue here, there have also been numerous other important prospective cohort studies of air pollution. This forest plot, plot just attempts to uh, demonstrate the somewhat consistent air pollution uh, related mortality effects across the studies. Just to give a couple of examples, a recent large study of cohorts of U.S. Medicare pa uh, patients have also observed very similar effects that we saw in the Harvard Six Cities and the ACS study. Another example is the Women's Health Initiative study that focused on cardiovascular events in postmenopausal women. Relatively large air pollution related cardiovascular effects were observed. One of the most consistent associations observed in these studies is that the association between exposure to fine particulate matter air pollution and again the risk of cardiovascular disease deaths. So, this is a very quick overview of the short-term and long-term studies, but they've clearly showed us that short and long-term exposure to air pollution contribute to cardiopulmonary disease and death. Now we want to know if reducing air pollution results in substantial and measurable improvements in health. Earlier I presented the results, the original results of the Harvard Six Cities study published in 1993. In 2006, an extended analysis of this cohort was published, which included analyses of an additional eight years of follow-up when air pollution in the six cities was substantially reduced. This is cool. Watch this. The graphics are cool, but what really happened is cooler, isn't it? Substantial reductions in air pollution, especially in the most polluted cities, and even after controlling for other risk factors, what we saw is this reduction in mortality risk, especially in the more polluted cities, but even in the cleanest cities. There were reductions in exposure to air pollution and reductions in mortality risk. A few years ago, Majid Azadi, Doug Dockery, and I published a paper that used matching air pollution and life expectancy data from the U.S. for the beginning and ending of a two-decade period of approximately 1980 and 2000. Over the last several decades in the U.S., we have essentially conducted a large nationwide natural experiment with our public policy efforts to improve air quality. In this study, we treat this nationwide effort as a natural experiment and ask the question, did cities with bigger improvements in air quality have bigger improvements in health measured by life expectancy, even after controlling for socioeconomic, demographic, and smoking variables? Well, the answer is basically yes. On average, the greater the reduction in air pollution, the greater the increase in life expectancy. 
However, there are clearly many other factors that influence changes in life expectancy. Nevertheless, based on various statistical models that control for changes in socioeconomic, demographic, and smoking variables, we estimated that a 10 microgram per cubic meter reduction of fine particulate matter air pollution was associated with an increase in life expectancy equal to about a half to one full year of life expectancy. Now there's a large literature that uh, has helped us understand the complex pathophysiologic pathways that characterize how air pollution contributes to ill health and even death. I'm not going to go into that literature, but it is fascinating in providing substantial biological plausibility to these, these effects that we've been observing over the years. I recently collaborated on a massive study with hundreds of scientists around the world to estimate the global burden of disease from many factors that contribute to disease. Worldwide, it is estimated that breathing contaminants, cigarette smoke, air pollution from the burning of solid fuels in the home, and ambient air pollution are all among the top 10 contributors to burden of disease. The global burden of disease estimates indicate that there are over 3 million deaths per year globally due to the exposure to ambient air pollution. The good news, at least for us in the United States, is that the study also estimated that deaths due to air pollution in the U.S. are beginning to decline due to successful efforts at reducing the pollution. There have also been a number of efforts to estimate the benefits and the costs associated with pollution control efforts in the U.S. Results of these studies suggest that the benefits are extremely and sometimes unbelievably high. So, we seem to be making major progress understanding the human health effects of air pollution. In the U.S., we are also having success reducing our pollution and improving public health. This is good news, right? Yeah. Well, interestingly enough, there are powerful interests that oppose substantial public policy efforts to reduce air pollution, and some argue that the air pollution research is largely secret science. Last August, Lamar Smith, Republican from Texas and the chair of the U.S. House Committee on Science, Space and Technology, and Chris Stewart, Republican from here in Utah, the chair of the Subcommittee on Environment, subpoenaed the EPA to release the secret science it uses as a basis for these costly regulations. Recently, just a few weeks ago, David Swikert, Republican from Arizona, replaced Chris Stewart as chair of the Subcommittee on the Environment. Within a few weeks, he, along with con Congressman Lamar Smith, introduced legislation called the Secret Science Reform Act of, or of 2014. <laughs> now, I am extremely supportive of open, peer-reviewed, and published research. So I think what I'm going to do is show you that secret science. Is that okay? Would you like to see it? The problem is I already have, right? There's nothing secret. This House subpoena, for example, the, the House Committee on Science, Space, or, or Science, Space, and Technology specifically subpoenaed three studies. One was that study on life expectancy. This is a study that has no confidential data. This study is the, all of the data I have made available to anybody that's requested it, including Congress, including EPA, anybody. So the data is publicly available. When I resubmitted it to them after the subpoena, they responded, oh, you didn't give us anything we don't already have. They were it was true. They also, they also subpoenaed 
the Harvard Six Cities results, and the American Cancer Society results. Now, it is true that both of those studies use data on participants where the studies went through um, what's called IRB approval, Institutional Review Board for Human Subjects. They have confidentiality agreements with regards to the data, the, the raw data, the individual data. Nevertheless, these studies have been analyzed, reanalyzed, and published in as open a way as, as, as you can publish data. Let me just give you a feel of that again. So remember, remember the Harvard Six City study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1993. The ACS CPS2 cohort study was published in the American Journal of Respiratory Critical Care Medicine in 1995. Hardly secret. There was the controversy, I've already mentioned this. Um, so what, what happened was, is the data, the, Har the Harvard data and the American Cancer Society data were made available to a large independent reanalysis team. This team uh, did a three-year reanalysis. It included 31 independent researchers with oversight from a nine-member expert panel and peer-reviewed by a special panel of the Health Effects Institute Review Committee. It included full data access that ensured the privacy and confidentiality of research participants. The reanalysis included data audits, full replication and validation, and extensive sensitivity analysis. Again, it was published in a special peer-reviewed HEI report in 2000. Also, there was a series of papers that looked at various detailed aspects of the reanalysis published in a special issue of the Journal of Toxicology and Environmental Health. In addition to that, the Harvard Six Cities study with, with different research teams has been, uh, there have been extended reanalyses of the Harvard Six Cities study, the Leyden et al. paper in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine, 2006, uh, Joel Schwartz and colleagues in Environmental Health Perspectives in 2008. You can see these are all being published, another, another paper in 2012 in Environmental Health Perspectives. The American Cancer Society CPS2 cohort study, I've already shown you a slide with the JAMA 2002 paper, a paper in 2004 in circulation, the Journal of the American Heart Association, paper in New England Journal of Medicine, a paper in Lancet, etc. All of these are being published in top medical journals uh, and, and, and very heavily peer-reviewed. Now what's even more important here is that Real replication doesn't mean you just reanalyze the same old data. Real replication is what we did with the Harvard Six Cities and ACS study originally. We, when we saw the results of the Harvard Six Cities study, we definitely wanted to replicate them in another data set, the, the American Cancer Society data set. And these, of course, have been reanalyzed in various ways. But what's even more important are the replicative studies in other cohorts. The Women's Health Initiative that I mentioned, published in New England Journal of Medicine. This study from the Netherlands, published in Environmental Health Perspectives. This, this paper of the U.S. National Medicare pay, uh, cohort uh, with a group of researchers at Johns Hopkins had published in Environmental Health Perspectives. You can see I can just keep going on and on. There's this big study from Canada that uh, I was involved with, just published a, a, few, a few months ago, well, about a year and a half ago. Uh, in environmental health perspectives, a paper that came out about a year and a half ago from, from Rome. And in fact, just barely in the journal The Lancet, really probably the top medical journal in, in Europe, uh, published a paper that, that does, it's, this is a big multi-centered uh, sort of what, what's sometimes called a meta-analysis of a bunch of cohorts throughout Europe, and again, they get roughly the same results. Now, even a broader review that I've tried to give you in this, in this quick uh, discussion, even a broader view of the PM air pollution and human health scientific literature should look like this. We should take these prospective cohort studies and recognize them as being extremely important and useful studies, but I've minimized them to recognize that they just, they're just one, one segment of the, of the evidence from the literature. We have, as I've mentioned already, these episode studies of mor morbidity and mortality. We have population-based cross-sectional mortality studies. 
that, that most of them were occurred in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, were very interesting studies uh, I haven't even mentioned today. These, daily, uh, these time series and case crossover daily mortality studies, I've just barely mentioned them. There's now hundreds of these, of these daily time series studies. There's time series and case crossover hospitalization studies, of which I, I briefly mentioned one with regards to um, uh, pediatric hospital admissions in, in Utah Valley with regards to the natural experiment with the steel mill, but there have now been hundreds of these types of studies that have been published. There's lung function and respiratory symptom studies, many of which we've done here in Utah, but have been done uh, elsewhere throughout the world. There are these intervention and natural experiment studies. The study I talked about with regards to life expectancy in the U.S. is one example of those studies, but there have been many others. There are these uh, cardio and cardiovascular disease event studies. I talked about the one study with, with ischemic heart disease events that we've done here in Utah, but there have been a number of these types of studies done elsewhere. There have been a number of studies of subclinical markers of cardiovascular uh, disease. These are important studies, and there, I, I, it, there's so many of them, it's very, very hard to review. There's these controlled human uh, and, and uh, human exposure and animal toxicological studies. Again, that literature now has become, become very large. If I really wanted to be obnoxious, what would I do? I just keep adding more stuff, right, on, on this. I will stop by just simply saying, and there's even some more. The literature on the health effects of fine particulate matter air pollution is large and compelling. I'm going to close right there and take questions. Thanks. So, President, how'd I do? We have a little time, right? Good. Yes. Uh, my name is John Bowie, and I'm from California, and we have a number of air basins that are non-compliant with the Clean Air Act. I'm wondering if you guys ever thought of subpoenaing the data or the information on who are the campaign contributors of these three congressmen. <laughs> so, no, I haven't even thought of that, and, and I'm not going to either. I don't even want to get involved with that. But, um, but it makes you wonder, right? Uh, it, it does make you wonder. And, and I don't pretend that I know all of what's gone on. I don't pretend that I understand entirely all of their motivation. I've tried to just present this factually with regards to what I do know. Uh, I do know that our congressman from Utah, Chris Stewart, I, I, I don't know the circumstances of why he no longer is on that committee and has left. It, 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 the, the recent uh, uh, science, uh, no, uh, Secret Science Reform Act, to my knowledge, he is not a, he, he is, he is, he is not a co-signer of that, that legislation. So I'm, I'm hoping that he's gotten wiser. I'm obviously hoping that others will get wiser. This is not a bad news story. Air pollution kills us. There's lots of things that kill us. We all die. The good part about this story is this is some preventable cause of death. This is, this is something that we can make public policy that actually improves public health in measurable, substantial ways. And not only that, it makes our valleys more beautiful, more, more pleasant to live in. It's sort of a win-win situation with the one exception. It does cost. I mean, it's not cheap to reduce air pollution, especially as we clean up more and more and more the costs on the margin grow as, as we continue to try to reduce our air pollution. However, I showed you just one slide, but right now the evidence suggests that the, the benefits still are substantially outweighing the costs associated with, with efforts to improve our air quality. Thanks for the question. Does the data say anything about uh, 
how the episodic nature of Utah's air pollution problem impacts health. And so we only have it for a few days out of the year and then the rest of the year it's, it's lovely. So do we have the same impact as, as places with more persistent air quality or how, how much does it uh, reduce the health impacts that it's this episodic? So it's an excellent question, and I don't have a particularly good answer for it. Um, we do know, at the way I sort of presented this, this, this evidence is uh, we have enormous amount of evidence that episodic exposure to air pollution contributes to disease and death. Uh, just a few days of elevated exposure increases the risk. I, I mean, at real high levels back in the old uh, ep uh, bad episodes, we had thousands of people die in some of these cities. In, in Denora, Pennsylvania, the deaths were twice, or were roughly 20 times higher than normal, that sort of thing. Our air pollution, our episodes aren't nearly that high, but we see increases in deaths, we see increases in risk of heart disease, especially uh, acute ischemic heart disease events. And so we know that these short-term exposures contribute to the risk. What we're trying to understand right now is how much do short-term exposures or even these intermediate and long-term exposures, how much do they contribute to the initiation and progression of underlying disease? Now, I'm actually working on a manuscript right now that focuses on that a bit more, and the evidence seems to suggest that both matter. The episodic nature contributes to the risk, and the long-term sort of more chronic exposure contributes to both initiation as well as progression of the disease. And so I, I can't give you the precise sort of how should we weight the importance of episodic exposure versus long-term sort of average exposure. The good news in Utah, long-term average, our exposure is not that bad. I mean, it's not pristine by any means. We average somewhere. We got some DEQ people here that could probably tell us better, but we're averaging right around, what, 11 micrograms per cubic meter along the Wasatch Front. Um, I mean, that's not spectacularly good, but that's not bad either. And, uh, but during our inversions, bad inversions, we have, we have really bad air pollution. There's no question about that. Although, our, even when we're really bad, we're only about a, uh, maybe about an eighth as bad as the very bad episodes in Beijing, for example. So it's, it's, it's a bit relative. Question? Charles Elzinga, Continuing Education, Weber State University. Hi. I had a question. What uh, do you feel we should do as individuals, uh, given this data, uh, to mitigate or to improve the situation uh, in our personal lives? Uh, one thought is, well, <clears throat> Maybe I should move to Heber City or to Eden or someplace like that where it's not as polluted. Uh, but then on the other hand, I see, well, that would give me more commute uh, pollution or maybe we should adopt policies of telecommuting uh, to reduce uh, air pollution from our automobiles. What are your ideas? So it's, a, it's a, an extremely good question and one that um, one that's going to be a bit complicated, and I can't really answer it for that reason because it's different for each of us. But there's a few general things I can say. Number one, we can make decisions ourselves to reduce our own exposure. So for example, if I want to go out and ride a bike or run, I stay away from doing it along busy streets. I try to, if, if there's a bad inversion, I try to go up above the inversion. We made a conscious we have, we've made a conscious cho choice with regards to where we live, to be away from major busy roads. We moved there when Geneva Steel was operating, so to be kind of away from Geneva Steel. Um, you, we can make conscious decisions about the kind of vehicles that we drive, too. Uh, there, are, it, there are some vehicles that are well within, well within emission standards. We have some very clean vehicles on the road, we have uh, vehicles that aren't so clean. Might as well drive a clean one. They're actually no more expensive to drive than a relatively dirty vehicle, especially when you're purchasing a new car. So as individuals, we can make choices in terms of our, in terms of our commuter choices. It makes sense to, to live near our jobs and to commute uh, you know, less. And you talk about you know, uh, uh, sort of um, remote uh, working situations, I, th I think we could probably use that more. 
But now let me, let me say, as individuals, we also have the responsibility to support and participate in public policy efforts. In the end, we're all breathing the same air. We live in the same air shed. So it still is fundamentally, uh, to a large degree, a public policy uh, uh, issue that we have to deal with. And so let's not be a bunch of free riders. Let's get involved. Let's do our very, very best to, um, to, to make a decision as a community that we're going to pay the cost to get the extremely large benefits of having valleys with clean air. Thanks for the question. Uh, right, right here. Okay. Uh, hi. Thanks uh, very much. I, I'm Dave Folland. I'm a retired pediatrician. I volunteer for an organization called Citizens Climate Lobby. We're trying to get federal action on climate change. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you would comment just a little bit more about the overall denial of science uh, among our legislators. Uh, we're dealing with the same thing with climate change. Our six Republican uh, legislators in Congress, two senators, uh, four representatives, uh, officially deny that climate change is an issue or something that needs to be dealt with. That's the same thing that you're dealing with with the Secret Science Reform Act. So would you comment a little bit more both on that act and uh, the overall issue of denial of science in our policy makers? Well, I'm not, I'm not really an expert on that. Um, I've, I've been this, you know, I've, I've experienced some of this. Um, my experience with legislatures are that some are remarkably bright, remarkably capable, uh, learn the science, uh, try to understand it and do a good job. Uh, others don't do so well. Uh, so it's sort of a mixed bag. Here in Utah, here in Utah, there's been, as I, <laughs> As I perceive it, there's been a substantial change over the last 20 years. I mean, certainly in the late 1980s, it was like we had, we had worse pollution than we do now, but it was like everybody wanted to deny the effects. Thank heavens today, we, have, we at least have some of our, of, of our political leaders that have become you know, not only aware of the problem, but seem to be trying to make responsible efforts to deal with the problem. So I, I couldn't even point out anybody, I, certainly I wouldn't want to point out anybody that's doing a poor job. I would, but I would hope that we as a community, including our political leaders, uh, work together and be a bit more responsible. It goes back a little to the question that you asked before. I actually am quite optimistic that we can deal with this problem. Even with, with regards to automobiles, we are not too far away from being able to drive an automobile that essentially doesn't emit anything. <laughs> so then I don't have to feel guilty about driving. My car's not emitting any air pollution. Now, my, I have a very low emitting car that we drove up here, but it does emit a little bit. And so I would hope that, you know, at least I'm optimistic that things have changed. The public is behind efforts to clean up our air. And, and, and if the public's really behind it, if we're behind it, more and more of our politicians, more and more of our political leaders will help. Not a great answer, but that's the best I know how to give you. Yeah. I just have a question about quality of life, and a lot of the data you showed talked about death rates, but mm -hmm. more in the sense of how it affects the day-to-day -day quality of life and productivity, and if those episodic events affect people's abilities just to get over the common cold, essentially, and how that affects more, not the high-risk patients, but more just the everyday Joe. Yeah. Well, the reason most of these studies deal with mortality or deal with death is because death is easy to count. It's easy to observe. Uh, it's, it's unambiguous for the most part. And, and, uh, but you're absolutely right. It's not just death. It's morbidity as well. And so we have done a number of these sorts of studies. So, for example, early on we looked at uh, and in fact, we're, we're actually revisiting some of the school absences data. But what we see is that, it, that, that uh, air pollution contributes to, to, to illness in children and more school absences. There is a literature, I didn't put one of these boxes up here, but there's a literature looking at um, work absences uh, that, that was done. Much of this work was done in the 1980s. And so we, we do know that both children and, and, and adults uh, have illnesses associated with the air pollution. And of course, that contributes to loss of school, loss of work, 
and 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 the and the the sort of unpleasant aspects of being being ill. Thanks. Yes. The cost of solving the problem receives a lot of attention, and I'm wondering what you can offer about the um, efforts to correlate that to the cost of doing nothing, um, the cost of healthcare and lost productivity, lost tourism, et cetera. Thanks. So I only really, I, I, I probably should have, I have another slide that illustrates that a lot better. Um, but there have been a number of efforts to evaluate the costs. And I'm not pretending that the costs aren't substantial. Uh, the remarkable, the remarkable thing is, is that um, the benefits just seem to be so much larger. So, um, so for example, I mean, I'm showing this this particular slide. This is for the U.S. I don't have any, you know, data specific to Utah, but for the U.S., the benefits and costs of the Clean Air Act from 1990 to 2000. So this has got some sort of retrospective as well as prospective analysis to it that the benefits are really very, very large, and the costs, while, uh, while they're significant, they're, they're, they're just not as large. And so, uh, and, th and there's another interesting thing, that the Office of Management and Budget each year puts out uh, an estimate of the costs and benefits associated with federal regulations and unfunded mandates. And over the last several years, their estimates are is that the reduction, that the, the the regulations associated with reducing fine particulate air pollution have significant costs, but the benefits are so large that they are about 70% of all of the benefits of all federal regulations and unfunded mandates. It's really quite amazing. Now, I will, be, I, I will admit that I'm sometimes a little skeptical about some of these monstrous benefits that, that, are, that are being estimated. They come from taking coefficients from the studies that I just showed you, applying them to a baseline hazard in an in in overall population, and then timesing it by some statistical value of life or some, st some statistical value of health. And then they add all those, all those benefits up, and you end up with things like, notice this is in billions, so you end up with, you end up with trillions of dollars of benefits across the United States. And the costs are estimated, in, at least in the United States, are estimated in, in, in the hundreds of millions, typically. Um, so uh, nothing, I mean, you know, I'm trained as an economist. We're the dismal science. Ain't nothing free, right? There's no free lunch. Uh, that's that's going to be true with air pollution, and at least clean air as well. We're going to take about a five-minute break here before we start with Secretary Jewell's uh, presentation. But uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Pope for a wonderful presentation.